Floridians are, are demanding 12 billion gallons of petroleum product every year. We've got to get it from somewhere. South Florida is a frontier area. Uh, there may be 100 or 150 million barrels of oil. There is no 100% safe way to transport fuel, uh, whether you have it in trucks on the road, in rail cars on the railway, in tankers on the open seas, or pipelining. The area is not really worth anything except for the coal or any mineral underneath it that is silver at this point. We ultimately are always using solar energy. It's a question of whether it's been just recently produced or whether it was produced back in earlier times. What's really important is that the United States plants can have accidents whose consequences would be as great or greater than the consequences of the Chernobyl. Could we eliminate almost all the pollution that comes out of a power plant? Yes, we could, at a price. Now that's some kind of energy, just to get up at this hour of the morning. Energy is an amazing thing. Did you know that it can't be created or destroyed, just changed from one form to another? It's all around us in those different forms. We use it to drive our cars, grow our food. It runs our lives. Everything we do requires energy. Our society is completely dependent on it. From the fuels we use for transportation to the fuels we use to make electricity, the United States is one of the highest consumers of energy per person in the industrialized world. And Florida, as one of the fastest growing states in this nation, is a huge consumer of energy. Close to a thousand new residents move into the state each day. They need electricity, transportation, and all of the services that require, you guessed it, more energy. But have you ever wondered where our energy comes from? Well, I think it's, I've never really thought about it really. <laughs> By two means, in, in my opinion, solar and water. Gas and solar and uh, water. Um, from coal, I think. <laughs> Actually, I, I honestly don't know much about it. How Florida, and in fact the entire nation, meets the challenge of supplying the needed energy today will have a monumental impact on the environment of tomorrow. And tomorrow is just over the horizon. Florida, like the rest of the nation, is addicted to fossil fuels. These are fuels that were formed by the remains of plants and animals that lived millions of years ago. Up until now, choosing between renewable energy sources like the sun, wind, and water, and non-renewable sources we call the fossil fuels has been easy. You see, the fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, and coal have always been there when we needed them. 
They've been cheaper, more accessible, and easier to use. Still, they aren't without their problems. For one thing, pollution is inevitable when you burn fossil fuels. And the fact is that sooner or later, the supplies are going to run out. And in the case of oil and possibly natural gas, it looks like it may be sooner rather than later. Oil is the most versatile fossil fuel on the planet. It drives not only our transportation, but industry as well. From crude oil, we get the gasoline that keeps our cars moving, and the jet fuel that makes Florida a global playground. Fertilizers, synthetic fibers, medicine, asphalt, even electricity comes from oil. If you go back to the years prior to the Arab oil embargo, which would be the early and mid-70s, you're going to find that Florida's electricity came from oil, about 55% of it. So when the oil embargo hit and the price of oil went up, the price of your electricity went up significantly also. At that point, many utilities moved away from burning oil to using natural gas, coal, or nuclear power to generate electricity. Still as a nation, our growing dependence on oil has outpaced our domestic production, forcing us to import over 50% of the oil we need just to maintain our standard of living. Over 66% of the world's known oil reserves are in the Middle East, historically a turbulent region. The instability of foreign markets, coupled with the decreasing supply of cheap available oil, has forced Americans to increase domestic exploration. With as little as five to six years of known domestic petroleum reserves left in America, the pressure is mounting to identify those areas of the country where there could be more. When we think of American oil, we think of Texas, Louisiana, and even Alaska. But Florida? In the mid-70s, a little town called Jay in the panhandle of the state put Florida on the map as far as oil and natural gas production are concerned. At its peak, Florida was among the top 10 producing states in the nation. Over the lifetime of the Jay Fields, more than 450 million barrels of oil and several trillion cubic feet of natural gas were removed. The fields are almost drained now, and so far, no significant new fields have been found. But oil industry officials haven't given up on the state. South Florida is a frontier area. Uh, there may be 100 or 150 million barrels of, of oil. I've heard that number used by other geologists. That's a, that's a fairly small number, a paltry number for uh, when you compare it to uh, Texas or Louisiana. But 150 million barrels is uh, several billion dollars worth of, of production and, and uh, to a small, uh, small company, small oil company. That's an important figure. That's a, that's a large number of dollars. But even with highly sophisticated exploration technology, there is no guarantee that drilling will bring oil. Incredibly risky business. You know, the way we operate is that we go in, we explore. Uh, the chances of making a discovery are something like uh, one in ten to one in fifteen. So, a lot of the wells that are drilled do come up dry, meaning that there is no oil and gas, or it's not in commercial quantities. And we need both of those things. It needs to be commercial, otherwise, it's uh, it's not worthwhile. And, and we plug and abandon the sites, and, and that's it. An increasingly popular alternative to oil is natural gas. Because it releases far fewer pollutants, it is considered the cleanest burning of the fossil fuels. But still, it's not without its drawbacks. Natural gas was formed by the same geologic forces that created petroleum and is often obtained along with it. Drilling operations for natural gas are the same as for oil, raising many similar environmental concerns. 
In the 1970s, when the federal government began regulating the price of natural gas sold via interstate pipelines, fuel prices were kept low, reducing the incentive to explore for new gas. Predictably, the supplies fell and the shortage developed. Partial deregulation in the 1980s made exploration more profitable. Today, the market sets the price. Since natural gas is affordable, it is used as a primary fuel in over 50% of US homes. But nationwide, it only generates about 10% of our electricity. With the exception of Florida, oil and natural gas exploration and drilling are major industries along the Gulf Coast states. Success in those areas has led industry officials to believe that Florida's coast has a lot to offer in terms of domestic oil supply. But to the people who live here, oil and natural gas are not necessarily Florida's most valuable resource. Our economy is very much dependent upon the quality of our waters. Uh, again, here on the Gulf Coast, tourism is a very important part of the economy. Commercial and recreational fishing, all of those in large part depend upon the quality of our coastal waters and our coast, all of which are put at risk by having nearshore oil and gas exploration. I think the risk is so small that it is worth taking. There's virtually have been no significant accidents in the history of the program. The last one in 1969, offshore California, and since then technology has improved significantly. So we haven't had any uh, significant damage from spills and no oil has reached shore since that time. The biggest spill uh, in the world was a spill from an offshore oil rig. Uh, it was in the Bay de Campeche off Mexico and that spill went on for months and it was such a big spill that the oil washed up on the Texas beaches. I think if everything was monitored, pro monitored properly, I think it could be an advantage as possible source of energy. I'm, I think that there are plenty of other alternative um, energy sources that could be used that they don't need to be destroying our coastlines and our oceans by drilling. Uh, well, I'm in completely and entirely against it, 100%. Are you driving a car? All right, how can you, if you're going to drive a car, you better start thinking about how we make the oil to get you to drive the car. So uh, state of Florida and state of California both are not realizing that uh, we're in an energy crisis. We've got to have the oil and gas. And we're doing it to the best of our ability and, and we're safe, we're very safe. According to the Center for Marine Conservation, studies do indicate that the real danger of oil spills comes not from drilling and exploration, but from the transportation of fuel in barges and tankers. Oil and gas are transported into landlocked states by pipelines and trucks. But for the coastal regions, and especially along peninsula states like Florida, the most cost-effective means of transportation is by tanker. And that, the center says, is dangerous. I think the chances of a major oil spill along the Florida coast are inevitable. The traffic, it's like traffic on a highway. I mean, you may not have very many accidents with time, but you're going to have an accident. You have to expect that there will be an accident. And uh, if we don't re get an adequate buffer zone around southern Florida, we are very likely to have a major oil spill. It's just a, a matter of probability. If you, you look at, took the total volume moved and, and the products moved and, and proportionally put that together, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, very safe. It's like the airline industry. When, when a plane goes down, they get wide headlines. But every day, people are killed in automobiles, and it's just shrugged aside. Well, the same thing nowadays with a tanker. As soon as something goes wrong and there's a spill, there's this overreaction factor. It makes, uh, whether it be a barrel or 100 barrels, it makes Associated Press, UP, et cetera. It becomes a national issue. The problem is, is if you have an accident, one time out of a thousand or one time out of ten thousand you still have the accident the oil still comes ashore and permanent damage can result there is no 
a uh, hundred percent safe way to transport fuel. Uh, whether you have it in trucks on the road, in rail cars on the railway, in tankers on the open seas, or pipelining. There have been examples of accidents in all four methods of transportation in the recent past. Now, they don't want us to take it from the ocean. They don't want us to drill onshore in certain areas of the state. They don't want us to bring it in by tanker. They don't want us to bring it in by pipeline. They don't want us to bring it in by truck in many cases. But they demand that it be there, that it be at a neighborhood gas station at an inexpensive price. Floridians are, are demanding 12 billion gallons of petroleum product every year, and we've got to get it from somewhere. There are some areas that are national treasuries. It's not just because we're Floridians and we like our beach. These beaches to Florida are like Yosemite to California or the Rocky Mountains to Colorado. They are what define us. And yes, we feel very deeply about protecting uh, our beaches and protecting our coast, protecting our waters, uh, because in protecting them for Floridians, we're protecting a national treasure. Unlike oil and natural gas, coal is found abundantly in the United States. Some estimates put our reserve supply of this fossil fuel at almost 350 years. About one half of the electricity produced in Florida uses coal as its source. Because Florida has no coal reserves of its own, we must import two million tons from other states each month in order to satisfy our energy needs. Coal mining is a dirty, often dangerous business. When it's buried deep inside the mountain, it's extracted by boring into the Earth's surface. Sometimes several miles of tunneling are needed in order to remove the coal. Eight hours a day, in almost total darkness, these men operate heavy machinery deep inside the Earth. They dig in tunnels sometimes no larger than 18 inches high and a few feet wide. Despite working around dangerous gas buildups and choking coal dust, miners can extract as much as 12 tons of coal every minute. Coal is found in layers or seams in the Earth's crust that can be from one inch to 100 feet or more in thickness. When these layers appear close to the surface, it's more economical to strip away the trees and topsoil to expose the coal. Often the actual mountaintops are removed, leaving a flat surface in place of the heavily wooded peaks. This method is called strip binding and it is the way 60% of the nation's coal is produced. After mining operations are over, the land is reclaimed by grading, seeding, and fertilizing, creating grassy hills on what was once the mountainside. People that live in this community need industry. They need flat land. They need places that they can bring or make industry attractive to to, to bring jobs to the community. And strip mining does that. The area is not really worth anything except for the coal or any mineral underneath of it that is sellable at this point. So when we extract it, we're not only tearing up the earth, but we're putting it back and we're making it better. There's no denying the important economic contribution coal mining brings to a community. But can we afford to overlook the environmental contributions forested lands make to the global community? These are the bank into which the sun puts carbon. 
from the atmosphere. Trees close the cycle. If we burn fuels, and we do, we must, we put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Trees take it out. They release oxygen, which we need to breathe. One of the greatest threats to the future of this planet is the loss of trees. I think it's not necessarily a clean business, but I think we all realize it's a necessary business. Uh, uh, we, the industrialized society that we live in needs coal, and uh, coal in the long run is going to be the fuel for tomorrow. The electric utility industry is the major coal consumer today, accounting for over 80% of the coal used in the U.S. Because coal is a domestic resource, it reduces our dependence on foreign oil. As we strive to conserve oil and natural gas, more coal is being burned, and as a result, significantly more sulfur dioxide pollution is put into the air. As coal burns, the sulfur impurities it contains combines with the oxygen to form sulfur dioxide. When it is released into the atmosphere, these pollutants are carried by the wind until they fall as acid rain. If the acid is not neutralized, the environment is damaged. Florida's coal fuel power plants spew out more than 700,000 tons of sulfur dioxide a year. They contribute to the over 94 million tons of carbon dioxide emitted by fossil fuel power plants annually. But efforts within the coal mining and electric utility industry to develop technology to deal with these problems have gone a long way toward making coal a better fuel for the generation of electricity. We're just now starting to look at new coal burning technologies that are much more efficient uh, in their production of electricity so that for every unit of electricity you get less carbon dioxide. Uh, but that really hasn't uh, been where the bulk of the research investment has gone. And our concern is if we get in, hooked into a whole other generation of coal power plants, it's going to be very hard to get off of those uh, over the next 30 to 40 years because there'll be a tremendous sunk investment in generating capacity, and it'll be very expensive for the country to write that off. Could we spend more money? Yes, we could. Could we eliminate almost all the pollution that comes out of a power plant? Yes, we could, at a price. And the question becomes, how much of your weekly paycheck, your weekly allowance, your monthly income are you willing to invest for that broad social goal of protecting the environment? And that's something we all have to decide. Orlando Utilities is one of the new breed of power plants utilizing clean coal technology. With a state-of-the-art scrubber system, they remove large quantities of sulfur before it goes up the smokestack. But that doesn't mean there's no pollution. Some sulfur is still emitted. And the byproduct of the process is a form of ash that must be permanently stored on site in a landfill. The bottom line on anything, and anything you do when you burn fossil fuels, is that you have negative side effects of that. And that's the trade-off that we as a country make, recognizing that on the plus side, electricity brings us enormous benefits. Fossil fuels are the form of energy upon which we chose to build our nation. That choice propelled us into the industrialized world and allowed us to become one of the most prosperous nations on Earth. But the prosperity we enjoy demands more and more fuel. As the supply diminishes, we are forced to face the question, where will our future energy come from? If we don't uh, develop our domestic resources, then we're having to rely on others. And a lot of it is actually in the Middle East, which is very volatile. One of the problems is it takes a long time to develop energy. Typically, it's uh, five to 10 years to do some of these offshore type operations. And so that we can't just turn the spigot on the day that we need it. As an oil dependent nation, we must develop energy alternatives that won't endanger our national security, deplete our natural resources, or pollute the environment that we live in. When you really think about it, uh, all of the known oil reserves in the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge 
uh, equal about seven months oil usage in the U.S. at today's rate. Now, if you take that oil out, I don't really call it uh, energy security. I call it energy insecurity because once you've used it, you don't have that anymore to feel secure about. Nuclear energy is the most concentrated source of energy yet harnessed, and uranium is the key. Unlike coal, oil, or natural gas, uranium isn't a fossil fuel. It is a heavy radioactive element found naturally in the earth. To be used in nuclear power generation, uranium must be processed and enriched. It is the splitting or fission of the enriched uranium atoms that gives us nuclear power. The enormous energy that is released when the atom splits is used to heat water that produces steam that turns the turbine that generates electricity. Five nuclear power plants generate approximately 17% of the electricity needed in Florida. This form of power generation has some distinct advantages. Nuclear doesn't have sulfur dioxide, doesn't have nitrogen oxides. Uh, it does not produce greenhouse gases that you might have heard of, which is carbon dioxide. It does none of those things. Still, a lot of people are afraid of nuclear power. People who recall the serious accident at Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania in 1979. At that plant's number two reactor, a partial core meltdown occurred, but the containment structure prevented the release of large amounts of radioactivity. According to the state of Pennsylvania, the small amount of short-lived radioactivity that was released into the environment had no negative impact on the health of the residents living in the surrounding communities. The accident did, however, underscore questions about the safety of nuclear power generation. In 1986, the worst nuclear accident to date occurred. At the Chernobyl power plant in the Soviet Union, huge amounts of radioactive materials were released when the steel and concrete shells of the operating reactor cracked. 31 people died almost immediately, and thousands of others faced long-term health problems. In the United States, a difference in containment structures, better operator training, and inherently safer plant designs led industry officials to maintain that an accident like Chernobyl could never happen here. The technology uh, in America and in most other parts of the world is much different uh, than the technology used um, at the uh, Chernobyl nuclear power station. Uh, the uh, Chernobyl reactor was a graphite moderated reactor. Uh, we use uh, water as a moderator in our reactors. But without getting uh, technical, um, what happened at uh, Chernobyl uh, could not uh, happen in this country simply because the design of the nuclear reactors are so different. While it's true that we cannot have the Chernobyl accident because we have different types of reactors, it's equally true that the Soviets cannot have the Three Mile Island accident. What's really important is that the United States plants can have accidents whose consequences would be as great or greater than the consequences of the Chernobyl accident. I have indication of a feed pump trip. Understand feed water pump trip. Main block valves going closed. It's crushed eye opening. This is a simulated system malfunction at a nuclear power plant in Florida. Here, licensed operators are trained on a continuing basis to deal with emergency situations. In the event of a malfunction, the plant is designed to shut itself down, minimizing the risk of an accident. Main block valves closed. I think it was 1985, the Congress asked the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, what was the probability of a major accident? And the NRC's answer was, if we had 100 plants running for about 20 years, one could expect to have a major core melt accident with a probability of about 45%. As small as they are, fuel pellets like this simulated one are what drive nuclear reactors. One pellet contains the same amount of energy as one ton of coal, 126 gallons of oil, or 20,000 cubic feet of natural gas. 
They are tightly sealed into hollow rods and placed into the reactor. Over 12 million pellets are used at any given time to power it. Periodically, the radioactive rods are removed and replaced with new fuel. Disposal of the spent uranium rods or nuclear waste is one of the biggest challenges facing the industry today. All of the high-level radioactive waste that is generated from the operation of our nuclear power plant currently remains on our plant site in spent fuel pools. According to nuclear officials, as long as the spent fuel is kept underwater, it's not dangerous. But when those on-site pools fill up, there's still no permanent way to safely dispose of the radioactive waste. This problem, coupled with negative public sentiment, are the primary reasons no new plants have been built or commissioned in the past 10 years, and none are planned for the near future in the U.S. It all begins with the sun. It's the source of all our fuels. It illuminates our world. It drives the complex process of photosynthesis, allowing plants to grow, providing us with food to eat. Heat from the sun causes water to evaporate from the oceans. The water falls as rain upon the land. And the rain powers our rivers. Even the wind comes from the sun as the air absorbs the sun's heat and rises through the atmosphere. The sun is the source of our energy, and perhaps it's through the sun that we should look for answers to our energy questions. All energy is ultimately solar energy. All the fossil fuels we're burning is fossil sunshine. The nuclear energy that we use is, is created by uh, nuclear reactions that occur uh, in atoms that were created at some distant time in the past in a supernova, uh, we ultimately are always using solar energy. It's a question of whether it's been just recently produced or whether it was produced back in earlier times. Though it is often thought of as a new technology, solar energy has been used in the sunshine state since the early part of the century, when almost all of the homes in South Florida used low-tech solar water heating systems. It wasn't until the 1950s when an all-electric home meant prosperity that companies began promoting the use of electric appliances and solar water heaters went out of style. The solar industry made a comeback after the 1973 oil embargo when people wanted an alternative to oil-generated electricity. Unfortunately, technical support for the industry, like qualified maintenance workers, wasn't widely available, and the solar industry declined. But the increased awareness of the environmental advantages of solar technology have recently revived the industry somewhat. Still, proponents of solar energy maintain that the lack of funding is the only thing holding them back. The United States' total commitment to uh, solar development, solar R&D, is, uh, although it's been growing, it's still very, very small. It's about the price of a single F-15 fighter. Uh, and we waste those periodically trying to protect the fossil fuel sources. So it's just a matter of choices. Solar is, of course, a viable alternative to fossil fuel generation. But the question becomes, is it a viable alternative on a large scale? When you're talking about the citizens of Florida demanding electricity in the billions of kilowatts, the question becomes, can you construct, first of all, enough solar facilities to meet that need? And secondly, can you construct those facilities in a way that's economically competitive with fossil generation? And the answer is no. In California, large-scale facilities have been built. Huge fields of solar collectors capture heat from direct sunlight to make steam for the generation of electricity. This solar thermal electricity is used to supplement traditional power systems when demand is highest. 
But what works in sunny California doesn't necessarily work in the Sunshine State. Believe it or not, here in Florida, it's just too cloudy to use solar thermal for large-scale electric generation given today's technology. But that doesn't mean other types of solar power won't work. There are several applications that are practical today, like solar water heaters and photovoltaic cells, which convert sunlight directly into electricity. At the Florida Solar Energy Center at Cape Canaveral, scientists are testing the efficiency levels of different types of solar cells, as well as other solar technologies. And even though Florida doesn't have the convenience of a desert to build large-scale solar collectors, we do have other options we can pursue. As you drive around Florida, and particularly if you fly over Florida, over Florida cities, you see hundreds and hundreds of shopping malls. And what you're actually seeing is area, land, that could be used for solar installations. That's just what environmental writer Ellie Whitney saw. In the late 1980s, she added a solar water heater and solar power system to the roof of her northwest Florida home. With the exception of her air conditioner and stove, she runs all of her appliances off the electricity generated by the sun. During the daylight hours, the solar cells on the roof of Ellie's home provide electricity. They also charge a storage battery that powers her home when the sun isn't shining. Occasionally, two days a year maybe, there will have been so many cloudy and rainy days in a row that the battery power gets low. If ever it gets too low, there's an automatic switching device which turns the system over so that it can draw power from the power plant. Though her 800 square foot house doesn't look much different from her neighbors, Whitney's utility bill does. Her use of solar as a primary power source keeps her electric bill under $10 a month. So why aren't more people turning to solar power? One reason is the upfront expense. It costs a lot to install a solar system, and it takes several years to pay for itself. Another reason is the misconception people have about the way solar power works. For instance, most people think that if the sun isn't shining brightly, solar doesn't work. According to Whitney, that just isn't so. I don't need sunlight. I only need light. And have you ever seen a day when you didn't have light? From the very earliest time in the morning until late in the evening, there is light. Even before I can see it, my battery is already charging. Wind power. It's one of the oldest energy sources and it produces none of the pollutants associated with burning fossil fuels. In the early 1980s, California installed over 15,000 wind turbines on top of their hills and mountain passes to take advantage of the strong, steady wind currents. Unfortunately in Florida, the winds aren't strong or consistent enough to make it economical. And until we learn how to generate power from low wind speeds, wind use will not be practical. With all the water in Florida, hydroelectric, the cleanest source of power generation, would seem like a good choice, right? Well, not exactly. Hydroelectric production requires a large elevation change, and Florida's topography is simply too flat. Other than three relatively small power generating facilities in the hilly region of North Florida, hydroelectric is not a practical option in the Sunshine State. About 6% of Florida's energy is derived from renewable sources. 95% of that comes from biomass, wood, plant matter, and agricultural waste. In fact, wood was a dominant fuel in the United States until the mid-1800s and is still the primary fuel used in most developing countries today. Another use of biomass is to produce biofuels. Through decomposition, biomass can be converted into liquid and gaseous fuels like ethanol and methanol, 
fuels which can be used as substitutes for petroleum products and natural gas. Incinerating garbage at a waste to energy facility is another use of biomass. Here trash is burned to produce electricity the same way coal or other fossil fuels are burned in a power plant. But dangerous household waste like old batteries and cleaning fluids can create toxic emissions when burned. These toxins get into the environment through smokestack emissions and residual ash. Keeping hazardous waste products out of the garbage is critical to the process. It will provide a cleaner fuel for communities with waste to energy plants, resulting in cleaner emissions. But burning garbage will not solve our energy problems. Waste to energy plants can only produce a fraction of the electricity that a fossil fuel or a nuclear plant can. If renewable resources are indeed virtually unlimited and environmentally friendly, why aren't we using more of them? The bottom line is cost. At first glance, it appears that fossil fuels are simply cheaper. But are they really? The cost society pays as a whole because of the activities of an organization or an individual are called externalities. When you buy cheap gasoline, the real cost of that gasoline, the social, public, health, and environmental costs are not reflected in the pump prices. If the billions of dollars spent protecting oil supplies in the Middle East were factored into the cost of gasoline, would we still be paying less for a gallon of gas than we do for a gallon of milk? From the destruction of Prince William Sound to the problems of global warming, these external costs are the price we pay for burning fossil fuels. The reality is there's a lot of costs we're not paying for in our energy bill. Uh, we're not paying for the health damage uh, to the lungs of children and senior citizens uh, from air pollution emissions. Uh, we're not paying for the full cost of uh, toxic materials introduced into the environment by energy production and use. Uh, we're not paying the full costs of, of radioactive waste disposal. Uh, estimates have shown that if you include uh, these costs in energy prices, uh, our energy bill would be anywhere from 25% to 60% higher than it is now. When you start talking about factoring in economic or environmental externalities, things that we don't consider now, you get into a very argumentative area. How do you put a cost figure on uh, some respiratory problems of a certain segment of the population? How do you start trying to quantify certain kinds of impacts? For example, how much is a certain species of a bird worth to you? How much would you be willing to invest to protect a certain species, recognizing that if you do that, you might be putting people out of work, or you might be raising the price of energy, how do, you, how do you put dollar figures on certain kinds of environmental resources? We need electricity, but are we willing to accept the nuclear waste, air pollution, or acid rain that goes along with generating it? Until someone discovers the perfect fuel, there is something we can all do right now to delay the need for more power plants. Look around your own home. Every situation that wastes energy not only increases your electric bill, it promotes air pollution, acid rain, and possibly global warming. Every time you walk out of a room without switching off the light, you're wasting energy and polluting the environment. Over the course of its lifetime, a 75-watt light bulb will contribute almost a ton of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Obviously, we can't live without light, but we can be a lot more efficient. And this is a good way to start. It's a compact fluorescent bulb, and believe it or not, one of these 15-watt bulbs puts out as much light as this 75-watt incandescent, using much less electricity. It lasts 10 times longer, produces almost no heat, and keeps that ton of carbon dioxide out of the air. 
And that's not all we can do. Check with your local utility company to see if they offer free home energy audits. According to some estimates, as much energy leaks through American windows every year as flows through the Alaskan pipeline. Cool air in the summer and warm air in the winter escapes to the roof, attic, doors, windows, and even electrical outlets and switches. By weather stripping, caulking, and insulating, we're saving more than money. We're saving the environment. One quarter of all the energy used in the U.S. is used directly for transportation. People need to go from place to place. They always have, they always will. For most of us, it's the car that gets us there. The typical American car uses over 800 gallons of gas a year, with each gallon putting 21 pounds of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Once it's there, it doesn't just disappear. You see, carbon dioxide is a heat-trapping gas. And as it builds up, it produces what we call a greenhouse effect. It simply makes the atmosphere hotter. Some scientists believe this greenhouse effect is actually causing the temperature of the Earth to rise, a phenomenon known as global warming. If this is the case, the effects of this warming could be catastrophic, especially for Florida. There's a lot of controversy over whether or not the warming that we have observed over the last hundred years means that global warming is underway. But where there is a broad scientific consensus is on the next 100 years, that if we continue to dump greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at the rate we're doing now, we're going to see a warming of anywhere from 3 to 8 or 9 degrees uh, Fahrenheit over the next 100 years. And that will lead to tremendous shifts in agricultural patterns, uh, uh, weather phenomena, sea level rise, uh, droughts, uh, more intensive storms and hurricanes. Uh, just a lot of things that we would be better off not to experiment with. Even without a scientific consensus on the effects of global warming, there is a fact that cannot be ignored, and that is, in Florida, eight of the warmest years of the century have occurred in the last 11 years. And yet we continue driving headlong into an uncertain environmental future, at least until we're given an option. Petroleum is just a wonderful thing, and you know, you look at the history of petroleum in this country and the world, I mean, it's an incredible source of energy, but there's no free lunch. Uh, basically, the, this global warming problem is the one that appears to be related to fossil fuels, and if that's as serious as some people think it is, we're going to have to move away from fossil fuels and find some way to stop these gases from heating up the planet. To offset the environmental hazards of the gas-burning combustion engine, alternate fuel sources are being developed. Roberta Nichols is an engineer with Ford Motor Company in Detroit and a pioneer in the field of alternate fuel technologies. Long term, the broad replacement for petroleum-based fuels, at this point in time, the best candidate looks like methanol. The reason for that is we can build a vehicle with the least departure from what the uh, customer presently feels comfortable with, has a good opportunity to be competitive in price, and there also is a very broad resource for producing the methanol. Methanol can be made from coal, natural gas, or even biomass, and its use helps us lessen our dependence on petroleum. It burns cleaner than gasoline, but it's not without its problems. Since there isn't a readily supply of methanol out there for people to refuel with, we need a transition vehicle or a variable fuel vehicle. This vehicle here can run on methanol or gasoline or any of the two fuels mixed together, and therefore it uses variable fuel. Since these cars reduce but don't altogether eliminate harmful emissions, there are those who say there's an even better alternative just around the corner. We used to be an electric vehicle society. In the turn of the century, the cars that were first put on the road and then the trolleys were all electric vehicles. We switched over to gasoline. Gasoline has this wonderful attribute. It gets us the farthest distance on the least volume, the least amount of gasoline. Electric cars, on the other hand, must rely on batteries to store the electricity used to power them. 
So far, battery manufacturers have not been able to come up with a battery powerful enough to give the car a driving range of over 100 miles. Since a gasoline-powered car has a range of about 350 miles, auto industry officials say consumers won't buy electric cars, and that makes them impractical to manufacture. People will still want to be able to travel distances, and the gasoline engine is still the logical alternative. I don't see battery technology progressing in a near five or ten years to the point where electrical powered cars will be practical for traveling long distances. But in places like California, where urban air pollution has become almost life-threatening, the environmental advantages of no tailpipe emissions becomes crucial. Even in Florida, where air pollution isn't obvious, the six largest metropolitan areas fail to meet the federal air quality standards on occasion. The electric vehicle offers an opportunity of reducing the pollution in the urban environment. But you have to be careful with that because you have to remember that there's a power plant someplace producing the electricity. And unless it's a nuclear plant, it is still using some form of fossil fuel. Still, proponents of the electric vehicle say it's easier to control the pollution at the power plant smokestack than when it's billowing out of the tailpipes of thousands of cars. Environmentally speaking, these cars have it all. Powered entirely by the sun, they emit no pollutants. Unfortunately, you can't buy one for under $100,000, and frankly, the technology isn't quite up to speed yet. This car's technology, however, is. Built in Melbourne, Florida, it utilizes the sun's rays as fuel for its electrically charged solar cells. But when the battery gets low, it relies on a backup engine that is fueled by either natural gas or even propane, both of which still burn cleaner than gasoline. The individual car isn't the only culprit in the air pollution problem. The trucks and buses used to transport food, goods, and even ourselves are putting millions of pounds of pollutants into the air each year. But that's beginning to change. Because of the tighter emission standards that came out of the Clean Air Act of 1990, some companies with large fleets of vehicles are beginning to replace the traditional gasoline and diesel fuel trucks with ones that burn compressed natural gas or even propane, the same stuff we use for home heating and backyard barbecues. The advantage in using these fuels is that they burn much cleaner than traditional fuels. They're cheaper, and the technology is here today. The disadvantage is that you need four times the storage volume to go the same distance. An average 16-gallon gasoline tank weighs about 16 pounds. Carrying the same amount of compressed natural gas would require a fuel tank weighing 400 pounds. There is no panacea when it comes to alternative fuels. We have assumed tremendous disadvantages from using gasoline and we're seeing the repercussions of that right now in terms of smog and in terms of oil spills but we've assumed these and we've accepted them and whatever alternative we go to we have to make sure that we are willing as a society to accept the, d the drawbacks of that alternative fuel as well until acceptable alternatives are available to the consumer, there are some things that each of us can do now to reduce the destructive effects of driving our cars. For instance, we can limit the amount of driving we do by taking advantage of carpools and mass transit. We can also make sure that the cars we drive are running as efficiently as possible by keeping the engines tuned and the tires properly inflated. As consumers, we can demand that automakers do everything possible to safely increase the fuel economy of the cars we buy. We think there ought to be an increase in the fuel economy standards for automobiles. Uh, we went from 15 miles a gallon to 27 and a half miles a gallon in the mid-80s because of the existing fuel economy laws. And we believe the technology is there to get us up to 40 or 45 miles per gallon uh, by the turn of the century. But it's clear the auto industry isn't going to do it unless it's mandated uh, by the government. They're choosing to put most of their technological improvements into higher acceleration and performance in their automobiles rather than fuel economy. We can make cars that get 50 miles per gallon, but they're quite small cars. They're quite different than the cars that most people want to buy. 
the, the customer is really not willing to buy that 50 mile per gallon, 2,000 pound car uh, if gasoline's selling for a dollar a gallon. The only way to reduce consumption of fuel is to make the fuel price higher. If you look at Italy, for example, the price of gasoline is over $4 a gallon, and the Italians per capita use about one-fourth the gasoline that we do. And so it does have a big effect. And, and that's the way, ultimately, we'll have to control uh, energy use. Redesigning cars isn't the only answer to our environmental problems. Designing the cities of the future, creating livable cities, may be the key to improving traffic, gridlock, pollution, and transportation frustration. The system's got to change before the individuals can. And we've got to get better mass transportation. We've got to get uh, more localization as opposed to this kind of urban sprawl that's been developing. Without that change in the system, individuals can't make the difference that they need to. We need to build our cities to save our countryside. And if we don't do that, our students, uh, when they're in decision-making positions, are going to inherit cities that are almost impossible to manage. They're expensive to operate. They're tremendously expensive to maintain, and, and uh, they don't generate enough tax revenue to pay for the services that are required. And what is a livable city? One with a mass transit system that's efficient, reliable, and easy to use. A city with safe, designated bike lanes and pedestrian walkways. Cities with thriving downtown areas where people can work, live, shop, and play without having to use their cars. But the most important elements of a livable city are its people. As we become more aware of the impact each of us has on this planet, we need to become more aware of our responsibility to protect it. Every day we make choices about how we're going to use the fossil fuels we have left. When we drive our cars, when we turn on the lights, even the things we buy determine how much longer those fuels will be around. The choices we make today will determine our quality of life, not only tomorrow, but in the long run. To purchase a video cassette of Energy in the Long Run, please call WFSU-TV at 1-800-322-9378. Credit cards welcome.